Well, good morning. We're going to do Hieroglyphs 101 today, and there will be a quiz. No present. Uh, I do want to also remind you that uh, we have a um, a card of appreciation for the entire Winds uh, Wind Pride. Star Pride? Star, Star, Star Pride. Pride. Star. I, should, I should read right here. Um, we have a hieroglyphic message of appreciation to the entire crew. And if you haven't signed it, please sign it. And we'll make some arrangement to, um, there's a captain's farewell this evening, and we'll make some arrangement to present it. Do we have to sign it with our own cartouche? <laughs> you get extra credit. <laughs> Definitely extra credit. But it's right here. and. Um, so we'll have it around a couple times today, so if you also hear from other people who haven't heard about it, it'd be nice to have as many signatures on it uh, as possible, because I think this crew really deserves a little, yeah. a little appreciation. Exactly. So, Hieroglyphs 101. I've talked to a number, now there is a handout in the back of the room. I didn't make very many of them, so you might have to share. It's the same handout that we had when we were in Luxor. So, Hieroglyphs. Um, hieroglyphs, of course, are used to write ancient Egyptian language. Um, very fascinating, as many of you know, that's the reason I got interested in Egyptology. And hieroglyphs are a phonetic language. First of all, they're not symbolic, they are phonetic, grammatically, it's a very, very complicated language. In fact, more complicated than English is, grammatically. So, but the thing that's important is that it's an odd combination of um, of structure because it is alphabetic. For example, when I say alphabetic, when I say alphabetic, that means one sign is stands for one sound. It's a little small, it's hard to see, but like here's a vulture and it stands for the letter the equivalent of A, or here's an, an owl, it stands for the letter M. And so like with other alphabetic languages, you can use those letters to combine in different ways to write letters. Because of course, what a written, what a written language about is writing vocal, is what, what you're actually saying. And so there's a, this, the whole function of written language, of course, is to record what you're actually vocalizing. So it has an alphabet, but it also, unlike other languages, has, um, so for example, we have an alphabetic sign It's supposed to be a little foot and a leg, and that's the letter B. Okay, that's an alphabetic sign. But there are other kinds of signs. For example, this, which is supposed to be a little aerial view of a house, and that is called a biliteral, because that's one sign that stands for three letters together. Okay, so we're already way off the Western languages. There are also triliteral. Triliterals, for example, One sign that stands for three letters together. There are also quadriliterals. So it's a very different kind of language. There are also um, signs that have no phonetic value. And uh, for example, um, if in English, I think I mentioned this, for, for example, in English, if I say pear, you don't know if I'm talking about the fruit or two of something. And in Egyptian, they, if it's a pear, let's see, if it's um, two, you do two little strokes after it. So there are a whole series of signs which have no phonetic value, but they help determine the meaning of the word. And so, we, for example, this, this letter, pear, it looks like a house. If you want to say it's pear the house, you do a little stroke. That means what's there is actually what's being indicated. So that means house. But because this is a phonetic sign, It can also be used in other letter, in other words, this is pair, which means to go forth. So what they're doing is they're using signs that look like something, not for what they look like, but for their phonetic value. And this is where the early people, the people who were trying to, to uh, decipher hieroglyphs got off on the wrong track, because they thought it was purely graphic, that whatever was shown is what is being conveyed, when in fact, it's the rebus system, where you take the phonetic value of something you can draw, 
and use that, transfer it to something you can't draw. The best example of this is, is the combination of a, you draw a bee, because you can draw a bee, and you draw a picture of a leaf, like a leaf from a tree, and you put them together, and it becomes belief, belief which is a word you can't draw. So that's really the system going on here. It's a rebus system. It is phonetic, but it's a very interesting combination of using <laughs> alphabetic, biliterals, triliterals, and then these determinatives that have no phonetic value at all. So it's a um, it's a very well thought out of well thought out language because there are a lot of hints. For example, <clears throat> this sign. Remember what that is? Onk. Okay, so you can write certain words in many different ways. So you can write, this is the simplest way, just using one triliteral, because it's, it's essentially, it's is the phonetic value of this. So that's a triliteral, okay? It's got one sign has three letters in it. But you can also write it in a more extended way. So you can write it. So this word is the same thing as just this word. What you're doing is you're writing out these other two phonetic values. And the, and the, the joy of that for people who try, try to read this language is if you're confronted with a short form of the word and you don't really know what it means, if you encounter the long form of the word, it's going to give you the hints of what the, re what the rest of the, the um, consonantal structure is of this word. Got it? Well, sure. fun, huh? How would the sure. writer know which one to use? Um, good question. How does the writer know which one to use? It depends on if they don't have a lot of room. For example, in formulas, I'll be showing you some slides where this word shows up over and over and over again, and they almost always write it in the short form because it's like ch -ch -ch, um, because they don't want to take up the room. It's less carving. Um, so in literary text, they'll often write it out more. If it's on the side of a building, like a monumental use, they'll usually use the, the short form. There's a, yeah, come. Um, How many Egyptians were literate and able to write? How many Egyptians were literate and able to write? Probably two to three percent of the population, which is really bizarre. You've been to Egypt, you've seen that the walls are completely covered with hieroglyphs. Two to three percent of the population could read that stuff, which means scribes, first of all, are very important, but it also is, again, a reminder of the sort of magical potency of the written language. By writing something, you made that actually happen. It didn't matter if you if people couldn't read it because the writing itself was had that power. Yeah. How, do we, how do we know exactly what the phonetic sounds are that are associated with it? How do we know what the phonetic sounds were? Often we, well, the, the consonantal sounds we're pretty good on because of bilingual inscriptions. For example, um, well, for example, the Rosetta Stone. Remember the Rosetta Stone that's, that is two different forms of Egyptian. It's hieroglyphs, demotic, which is like for a form of Egyptian, and Greek. And with that, the major repeating feature was the name Ptolemy and Cleopatra. And that could be read in Greek. And so the people who were working, like Champollion and others, just started matching those repeating groups. And because those names are written phonetically, they could match the letters and hier the hieroglyphic sign to the Greek letter. And because there were so many different examples of it, they could say, that's got to be a P, that's got to be an L, that's got to be a, you know. And so that's, so it's through the bilingual inscriptions that we have the consonantal structure. What we don't have is the voweling, because this is, like many Middle Eastern languages, shows no vowels. Although, this is not a vowel, trust me. The A here is not a vowel. Um, and so, we don't know. For for example, this word, pear. We pr we conventionally pronounce it pear. Egyptologists stick a vowel in the middle so you can pronounce it. Because you can't, when you're talking to your colleague, you can't say house, enclosure, uh, stool, foot. You know, just you can't do that. You have to actually pronounce the vocalization. So we have a conventionalized vocalization. For example, this is pear, what we call pear. But if you have two consonants, the vowels could be almost anywhere. So it could be, it could be um, poor, you put two vowels in the middle, it could be aper, it could be, so we don't really know what the vocalization is. There's a whole subspecialty of Egyptologists, and I try to stay away from their journals because it's just, that is working on the vocalization of Egyptian. And pe people are making a lot of progress, but it's, it's, 
it's like the holy grail in Egyptology. Now there is the, la the latest stage of the Egyptian language, or rather the latest stage of writing the Egyptian language. It is written in Greek letters. It's called Coptic. It's actually the vestiges of the old language written in Greek, and in Greek, of course, they write vowels. So there we do have the insertion of the vowels, but the linguists are saying, that is thousands of years later, and it's very possible the vocalizations changed. So, hard to say. Okay, so let me show you some pictures. Okay, so the little tiny alphabetic chart. And so, for example, down here, here's a, here's a, um, here's this sign, believe it or not, is this one, and this sign is this one. And so this is this is a K sound, this is an A, an a sound, so this is the word ka, not the same as the spirit. But it shows you how the, how purely alphabetic writings uh, go. For example, the name Khufu, you remember Khufu? The guy who built the Great Pyramid? His name is completely alphabetic. You can just pluck the, the signs, alphabetic signs off the chart and write Khufu. The question is the sign direction, because Egyptian, as I mentioned to you, is very, very extraordinary in that it can be written from left to right or right to left, and it can be written horizontally or vertically. And the trick, as many of you already know, is you figure out which way the signs are facing. For example, here are the birds and the snake and the guy are all facing to the right, and so you read it from right to left. And so this is the, the sign, uh, the order of reading the signs is indicated here. So it's right to left, so you go right, so left, right to left, and then you drop down and complete that before you move further to the left. So you're doing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And again, you want to complete each group before you go, before you proceed. Now it's also, as you notice, they're very careful to not leave unsightly gaps. They don't like unsightly gaps. So they want to make nice, beautiful little compositions because it's a beautiful script. It's an absolutely gorgeous script. So you want to not have awkward spacing which means sometimes they will actually um, switch the order of some signs. So there are sometimes kind of difficulties with this. And as you can see, there's no word division and no punctuation. And that's where the, the determinatives, the signs that have no phonetic value, remember like pear and pear, where you put a, either a fruit or two slashes, those are really, really handy for figuring out where the end of a word is. But it can be really complicated when you've got a whole bunch of alphabetic signs and it's like, you have to just start plowing through it. Now, now that you know this, take a look at this. This is a, this is a uh, seal in our collection. And I've also mentioned that the hieroglyphs work very, very closely in conjunction with any pictures, any reliefs. And so here we have a stila. This is a guy, his name is Harciese. And it's, he's shown twice. This is him without a wig. He's, here, he's got his big fancy wig on. And here he's adoring the god Atum, and here he's adoring the god Rehirati, because here are their names written in front of them, little Thopolins. Now, notice the direction of the signs. Down here, what direction is this stuff written? Right to left, right to left, because you see that like the snakes and stuff are facing this way, so you read it this way. And then on this side, what's going on? Left to right. Left to right. Why? Facing left. Okay, because, but who's facing left? The creatures. Okay, look at more of the stila. Why would that be switching directions? King's on the other side. Because this guy, this guy switches his orientation, and this is this is actually says words said by the priest of Montu. Uh, Lord of Thebes, Harciese. So this is his thought, this is his dialogue. And so because he's facing this way, his hieroglyphs face this way. When he turns around, his hieroglyphs turn around. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> and this becomes really important to observe sign direction when you have something like this. You get one big block of hieroglyphs over their heads. And what you do in this case is you look carefully and say, okay, this is Ray Harakti facing the right, and this is a woman, these names during this period are great. Her name is Jed Kansu U.S. Ankh, which means Kansu said she will live. It's a lovely name, kind of wordy. But now, so, so she's facing this way, he's facing this way. Now, it's a little hard for you to see because it's small, 
but the hieroglyphs in this line and this line are facing the same direction as he is. So that means those two lines belong to him. And you see this line? See a little hard to see. Here's a person that's seated in a chair. Here's a snake. They are facing the same direction as she is. So all of this jazz goes to her. Hmm. And so when you when you go home and you start looking at your slides and you start looking at stuff in the Karnak Temple or Luxor Temple, look at the hieroglyphs and look at the figures and I think you're going to start seeing this stuff switching back and forth and you'll know why. Because it's going to be by a character who's facing the same direction as those hieroglyphs. Yeah. And it, it seems like there's a lot of what I would call mirror text where it literally was one half going this way and the exact same but going the opposite. That is because you're probably looking at scenes of the of the king offering to the god, and there are some standard formula that occur in those scenes. So that's probably what you're looking at. But one was going one way, one was going the other way because the king was offering. The exact no they, variation, they, it's just the text was completely swapped. Does that make sense? Could be. Okay. Yeah, could be. Okay, another thing they love to do, oops, is they love to incorporate hieroglyphs into larger scenes. Now, what's this sign? Uh, Talk means life, right? So here we have a hieroglyph that's turned into a thing. This is a faience honk. This was put in the tomb of uh, King Thutmose of the Fourth, and so this is something lying around in his tomb that he could use to ensure that he has life. Okay, so that's the hieroglyph for honk. <coughs> what do we have going on here? Offering. Life. Yeah, here he's he's actually receiving. Oops, here he's receiving honk. So here. Again, they are inserting essentially a writing of a word into the scene to tell you exactly what's going on. How did the, the um, discern between receiving and giving an offering? Uh, because, first of all, the king doesn't give life, the king receives life, so I know that. And also, what we have are um, the traces, this is from the, the, the Temple of Amenhotep uh, III, what we have are traces of uh, the bow that the king is receiving from. So. You, you need the bigger you need the bigger picture. This is cropped crop so closely that you wouldn't be able to tell. Also, those of you who have your hieroglyph sheet, look at the top left. What do you see here? Give you life. Given life. And so see, that's another indication. It's clear that he's being given life. Because he is this is given life, it's not to give life. So he's clearly the recipient and not the uh, not the donor. And why? It's just been so repetitious. What do we have back here? Um, and then there are several of you who are really, really going at this in the <laughs> temples. And on your hieroglyph sheet, uh, under adjectives and nouns, the right column, um, about halfway down, you see life again, and then you see this one, stability, and you see this one, looks like a cane, that's dominion. And so th this is a sign that's not on there. This is protection. So this says all protection, life, stability, dominion behind him. Behind him is actually on your sheet. It's the last of that, it's, but it's, it's cut off here. So again, you know, you can already start reading some of this stuff because it's very, very repetitious. Okay. This is a, a title that we saw a lot at Karnak. It's on your sheet under um, left, left column, King's Epithet, second one. And that is you see it there? Yeah. King's epithet, second one down, King of Upper and Lower Egypt. So it's the composition of the uh, Chris, this is the one we were working on yesterday. So you've got the sedge plant, the bee, and the two bread loaves. All of this together, four signs spells King of Upper and Lower Egypt, one of the most common titles for the king. And as you notice, remember when we were in the temples, the walls were covered with cartouches. Remember those ovals that contain the name of a king or a queen? And so those cartouches are usually never in isolation. They're going to be preceded by, the, by this, which um, the cartouche that comes after this is the coronation name. So, okay, King of Upper and Lower Egypt. Okay, here we go. 
Hmm? Nesubit. In, in Egyptian, it's the, the whole title in Egyptian is we conventionally pronounce it Nesubit or Nesubiti. And here we have a Karnak temple. Okay. What's this? Okay. Then this. King of Upper and Lower Egypt. King of Upper and Lower Egypt. Okay. And then the next title is on your sheet. Um, it's right below the title we just looked at. Lord of the Two Lands. Do you have a sheet? Here. No. Actually, you're going to have to share with, share with people. I'm sorry. Um, I've got one crumpled up one at the podium. So the next title down, can you see that on the sheet? Lord of the Two Lands. And this one has a little extended writing. The, on the sheet, it just has the two flat lands. And then this one has geographic markers. These are determinative. So in case you're completely brain dead, it lets you know that these are uh, geographic. So yeah, so here you are. You're, you're reading these uh, the titles. May the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Lord of the Two Lands, and that his name live. That's what that says. Easy. <laughs> Quite a while. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a while. Okay. This is, so if you, you walked up and you saw this, even if you can't read it, what would you tell somebody? It's a cartouche. It's a cartouche. It's a royal monument. Okay. And which way does it read? Right to left. Right to left. Oh, you guys are quick. It's not even lunchtime yet. Now, another very important title is this one, which is on your sheet. Son of Ray. Yeah, if you don't have a sheet, try to find somebody you can sit with. Yeah, Son of Ray. Okay, Son of Ray. What a cool title, right? Ray is the sun god. So calling him the son of the sun is that's pretty pretty pow powerful stuff. So when you see this title, Son of Ray, that follows that precedes the second cartouche. So when you see Son of Ray and another cartouche, this is the family name. And this is Remember the woman whose temple we went to? Hot Shepsut? This is what you spell the name. This is Hot Shepsut, which means foremost of the noble ones. Almost all the names in ancient Egypt mean something. They're called theophoric names. So for example, Ramses, Ra is the one who bore him. Thutmose, Thoth, the god Thoth, is the one who bore him. Uh, Tutankhamun, living image of the god Amun. And the personal names too, like Jen Kansu U.S. Ankh, as I mentioned, Kansu is the one who said she will live, or Tahir Disu, I love these late period names, Ta is the one who made him. So they, it's, and so when you're reading Egyptian uh, books about ancient Egypt, and I hope when you go home, of course, you're just gonna like read all sorts of books about ancient Egypt. But when you stumble into these names, these crazy names, if you think about the gods whose names you've heard, like Amun or Thoth, or Ta, you're going to see those names and you can break those crazy long names into bits and it'll make much more sense for you. Okay, so that's this title, Son of Ray. And notice, uh, this is actually the masculine form. Uh, at one point in her career, it actually calls, it, there's a feminine marker here, but this is flat out when she's like genderless. Okay, another very important character. The Karnak Temple was built to the god. His name is Amun. Okay. This is the writing of his name. There's a, this is the I. This is supposed to be a game board with pieces on it. That's M-N. This is another N to reinforce that biliteral. So this is the, wa the wavy lines of water. Very common because it's an alphabet sign. So I-M-N. That's the way you spell his name. What's this? Ra. Ra. So this is the god Amun Ra. That's the way you spell his name. And of course, it's written from right to left. This is from the Luxor Temple because it says uh, Kenti Ipadef, who, who is in his southern harem, as it's called. So this is from the Luxor Temple. So now we're going to go a little bit more advanced. This is a cup from the tomb of Tutankhamun, but you can actually read a bunch of this. Okay. So look at this stuff. So we've got two cartouches, so you know it's a royal thing. So start here. King of Upper Lower Egypt, and then this is the cartouche, which would be his coronation name. It's Neb Keperu Ray, which means possessor of the forms of Ray. Again, these guys are not at all modest. 
and then you continue to this title, Son of Ray, and this is a T W T onk, and this word. Remember the name of the god? Amun. Amun. Tudonk Amun. That's what you spell his name. And then, how about this? Given life. And this is the word forever. So given life forever. How do we know which direction to read that? Uh, good question. Because when they do these complex compositions, first of all, if, so what we have is a combination, this is why Egyptian is really great, combination of vertical and horizontal writings here. So what they've done is they've done, you, do, you read this and then this, which are vertical, and you can tell that from the combination of the title and the cartouche. Okay, because this title always precedes that cartouche. This title also always precedes this cartouche. Okay, they've done that. But then this goes right to left, horizontally bridging both of those columns. And they do that, I'm not sure why they do that. They do that because they can do that. It's, and so this is, yeah, so this is, so this reads horizontally. So, I mean, this is, this is the fluidity with which these guys are arranging the hieroglyphs. It's their, oh, are you okay? Okay, nice entry, nice entry, wow. <laughs> and, and then also you can read, how about this group right here? Amun Ra. Amun, remember the I, the, the game board, the end, Amun Ra. And then this is Lord of the Thrones of the Two Lands. Uh, it, it's, and this, this is really interesting how they do this because in Egyptian writing, if you're talking about a god and there's a formula or a reference to him, it, it upsets the whole word order. They push the name of the god to the beginning of the phrase. So this is... This reads, Beloved of Amun Ray, Lord of the Thrones of the Two Lands, but they put the name Amun ungrammatically at the front of the sentence to honor him, because you don't want to have the name of the god, you know, down at the bottom of the sentence. So that can create a few few issues, because this is actually a participle which should be up, grammatically, should be up at the beginning of the sentence. So, and hey, again, you can note some of the, here's Amun, Anybody remember this sign? We saw it. It's, it's the yeah, hands above the head. It's the caw, the symbol of the caw. So it's lovely. It says, "May your caw, may your caw live." Um, your caw is what your spirit. Line? Spirit, yeah. May your caw live. This is this is called the wishing cup of Tutankhamun. This is classic Tutankhamun Baroque. It's this fabulous piece of alabaster, got this big, carved, and. Um, and also, so when he would drink out of this, like a two-handled mug, it would look like he's uh, smelling a flower. Because, of course, it's in the form of a flower. Susan. So they were doing this for thousands of years because they thought they were going to come back. Just their spirit. They thought at some point they were actually going to come back to this. No, they were, the, the question is about the spirit coming back. The spirit does not come back. The spirit stays in the afterlife, in that parallel universe. The spirit is not going to come back to the land of the living. So this is all just symbolic that they would need to be using this in the afterlife. Well, it's possible he used it in his life also. Oh, okay. And then they put it in the tomb. Uh, this is the category of stuff that it's, it's hard to figure out when it was made. But this is also a great illustration, not only of this sort of pun of smelling a flower as you drink out of it, but these handles, these are completely um, composed out of hieroglyphs. There are about six diff different hieroglyphs in here. <coughs> the little squatting guy means millions. He's sitting on a half circle, which means possessor or owner. He, you see the onk signs, so you got that. And then the little ribs are millions. So this whole thing to the literate Egyptian reads, may you be a possessor of millions of years of life. It's just, it's lovely how they incorporate hieroglyphs into so many different types of things. So, one more follow-up on that. If, did it never occur to them that burying their wealth was maybe not the best use of resources? <laughs> <laughs> you are so Western. The question was, did it not occur to them that burying their wealth was not the best use of resources? No. No, <laughs> no it didn't. 
But actually, actually, it did at one point because there's a, a period of recession at, right at the after the time of the Valley of the Kings, and the tombs have been moved to the northern part of the country, and it seems as if there is state-sanctioned inventorying, plundering of the tombs in the Valley of the Kings, and they're taking goodies out of the tombs and using them for the later pharaohs. But again, they're going from one tomb into another tomb. So they're going out of circulation and back out of circulation. That's, I'm thinking that if it weren't for the tomb robbers, the economy would have collapsed way before it did. Because I'm, not so sure, I'm not so sure that you're right, that the economy would have collapsed if tomb robbers wouldn't have brought the stuff back into circulation. Egypt had a lot of stuff. Uh, they're sitting on the on the biggest gold mines. They're they're like it's too much trouble for them to get the gold out of the mines, which is why they conquered Nubia and say, okay, Nubia, you know, bring us the gold. And this is why the stuff from Tutankhamun is so over the top, because this is a, a period of tremendous political domination, and the Nubians are supplying. You, we see these scenes from the tomb of Tutankhamun of the people bearing these enormous rings of gold. They're they're casting it as rings and bringing in these huge bunches of. Uh, of uh, amethyst and uh, carnelian and feathers and ivory and ebony and all that stuff is reflected in the tomb. It all comes out of Nubia. It was their, their cash cow. Okay, this is from the obelisk of Hatshepsut. This this wonderful scene of Hatshepsut being embraced by by who? Okay, the tip off is the two plumes, but here the writing of the name Amun Re. Okay? And what's going on back here? Given life. So he's like snuggling with Hatshepsut, and as a result, she is actually being given life by, by the king. It's like uh, she's already some. Yeah, yeah, like here, right? Yeah, so she's already carrying, carrying it on. Um, and this, uh, this, this is great. It says, um, he makes her heart happy. Aww. It's lovely. And this this is her other cartoon that reads from right to left, Mont Carey. It's a little harder to see, but um, again, okay, now this guy has two tall plumes, and you'd say, he doesn't look like Amun, so who could this be? This is when it's really handy handy to be able to read hieroglyphs. So who is it? Son of. It's Amun Ray. He's just shown in a completely different form. And so this, again, as I said, is very, very important to be able to read hieroglyphs because when you're working in these temples, if you can't read the hieroglyphs, it's like, you know, you don't know what the score is. You know, you don't know who's who. And, again, all of this repetitious stuff. Given life, given life forever. Um, um, life, may, may, may he live forever back here. So, again, it's very, very repetitious. And here from the same... Really beautiful. This is a Middle Kingdom shrine. The, the, the uh, carving is some of the, the best in all of Egypt. Look at the detail. Look at all the little detail. This owl, little pointy ears, and all the all the feathers. Little quail chick with the little feathers. Uh, just an amazing. This is a, a rolled up mat. Just a huge amount of time expanded this. Okay, so you can read parts of this. You know, it's a royal monument, right? Because it's got a cartouche, and we've got. King of Upper and Lower Egypt, and then we've got these signs, this stability we looked at, and dominion. So this, and this means all the the um, adjectives follow the nouns in ancient Egyptian. So this is all stability and dominion. This is the word for health that's always that's also on your sheet. So it's offering all dominion, all stability, dominion, health, like like who, Rock. like wrong. So this idea that you're offering the stability and dominion of the sun which the sun is always there and always stable. So that's why that's such an important wish. And we've got springers from different crowns. Here's their little dialogue. A lot of, lot of giving life to, to, uh, to the kings in ancient Egypt. Okay, here's your final test. Who does this belong to? Okay. Even if you don't know these signs, start, so you've got, what's this one? Amun. Uh, what's this? Amun. Okay. Amun. It's Amun. Okay, I'll give you a hint. This is a T. Tutankhamun. 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 T W T Ankh Amun. Tutankhamun. What's at the bottom? I mean, why, is it, why do we have the bottom? The bottom is they usually have a name and then they have what's called an epithet, which is a honorific title. 
reminding you how great these guys are. This is Pega uh, Yunushmau, which means ruler of the southern Heliopolis. In other words, Thebes, ruler of southern, uh, ruler of Thebes. And so I mean, the, they loved, especially Tut. He was just, he, he has his name on everything. So it's like, you know, so it's, and this is a box. It's like, it's big. A uh, beautiful thing made out of uh, eb uh, out of ebony. This is all stained and painted ivory inlay. The thing is just spectacular. This is to toured in the United States several times, so some of you may have actually seen this thing. It's really, really beautiful. A thing that's really funny. Oh, also, I want to. This is a great example of this. Remember when I was talking about Egyptian art? If you were at that at that lecture, and I was talking about how things are shown in different viewpoints and they combine them. This side is a game board. Okay? It's showing you the top of the game board as if, as if you're looking right down on top of it. So those are the squares in the game board. These are the markers. And they're being shown as if they're standing up on the side, but they're actually supposed to be on top of the game board. This is, I, I've got to remember to use this when I talk about that sort of thing. It's a great example of these two different perspectives that are then combined. Um, this Tutankhamun's tomb is quite interesting because there are a lot of times his name is misspelled, which is kind of funny. They, really? They, yeah, they, they often put the tat on the other side, which is completely wrong. It, it just, it's just a goof. So, so um, I think you all pass. So, thank you very much. I'm very happy to answer any questions. And that, I promise, is my last lecture. Oh. <laughs> It's definitely a picture of a game board. It is definitely a picture of a game board with the markers. So, yes. so it could be it's, it's called Senate. Senate is the name of the game. So it could be used as a word, meaning Senate. Yes, if, exactly. You're, you're quick. So if you had that sign, if you want to write Senate, you have, have this and you put a stroke next to it, a line, which means that's what I'm writing about. Okay. That, because this is the phonetic value MN. Remember, Amen. Yeah, man. So this enters into a lot of different words. So you see this game board all over the place. But if you're writing about a game board, you use that sign and put what's called a stroke determinative, just a stroke next to it saying, that's what I need. Um, likewise, if there's a stroke, it could be, it could be a quail. Well, yes, in, in, in theory. In, in theory, yes. Although there is a longer, like Senate, the name is Senate, and so often they will write it out phonetically and they use this as the big determinative. But you can, in theory, what you said is he's got exactly right. So there's a lot of lot of variation. Is yeah. Dick. Well, what do you know about how this evolved over time? What do we know about how this evolved over time? Good question. The first Egyptian written records are about the year 3,100 BC, and they are about the king, as opposed to Mesopotamia. The first written records are about the the economy. So very different motivations for writing the language at that time. The Egyptian language evolves very, very rapidly. And it's kind of a mystery to people because it, we have some, um, some signs. And it, it appears to be, now this is the weird thing. Uh, from what I learned in graduate school, it's completely wrong. All of that's wrong. There's a whole, a whole bunch of new work that's been done. And it's really weird. It seems as if the the earliest hieroglyphs are, in fact, being used for their phonetic value, which drives the linguists like, wah. Because in theory, it should be you have a pictographic system, which then evolves into whatever the system is going to be. But the earliest hieroglyphs that we see from the tombs of the first kings at Abydos apparently are being used phonetically, which is very, very odd. And so because of that underlying phonetic understanding of the language, it evolves very rapidly. Very, very rapidly. Now, in the classical period, about the year 1500 BC, there are about 800 commonly used hieroglyphs. But there are several thousand more that are used. Now, when I, when I and my colleagues, when we're working with, with hieroglyphs, of course, you know, just like if you study any, ancient, any foreign language, you, know, you, you learn it. But for example, if there are signs that I don't know what the value is, we have a thing called a sign list. 
and it's arranged by like birds, boats, tools, nature, flat, low signs, and you look up the picture of the sign and then it tells you what the phonetic value is, and that way you can then go to the dictionary and translate the word. I'm sorry? Um, there, this, this ancient Egyptian language, which was written in a number of different scripts, so hieroglyphs, hieratic, demonic, and Coptic, is not related to, to Arabic, to the, to the Egyptian Arabic. It is not related. Although there are some, some interesting, maybe coincidences, for example, the second person singular pronoun is K in both of them, the first person singular pronoun I is I in both Arabic and, and ancient Egyptian. But the linguists say that's probably a coincidence. They, they, are, they are unrelated. They're actually different language families. And ancient Egyptian is apparently related to, again, when I was in graduate school, we thought it was a, a Hemitic language or a Semitic Hemitic language, as now we're saying. So it, it seems to be kind of a one-off. Yeah, Ross. Any more comments or questions? Yeah. Hey. Don't forget to sign oh, Emily's hey. hybrid lesson. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Right. So thank you very much, and let's enjoy our DNC, most of it. <laughs> <laughs>